Um, and before we start, um, I will do an acknowledgement of country. Um, for those of you who are joining us who is not um, familiar with this practice, an acknowledgement of country is basically a respectful practice that we try to do in Australia um, to acknowledge that actually on this continent, um, we are on um, this continent is actually made up of hundreds of um, countries of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, people. So um, I would like to acknowledge that I live and work on the lands of the Wurundjeri and Bunwarang people of the Kulin Nations. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional lands that this digital platform reaches and extend this acknowledgement to First Nations people with us today, as well as elders past and present. Um, I'd like to bring uh, your attention to a few house rules before we really get underway. The talk tonight lasts uh, 75 minutes uh, and is expected to be complete by 6.45 p.m. Hong Kong time or 8.45 p.m. Melbourne time. During the talk, only myself as the moderator and the speakers will be able to use the video, audio and screen sharing function. If any of you um, audience members would like to ask the speakers any questions, please type it into the Q&A chat box, which again is at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to answer them during the Q&A towards the end of our session. We will also be recording this talk and reserve the right to use the recordings taken. Okay, so welcome everyone to our first virtual live streaming talk, the Event Tide Conversation Series presented by the Hong Kong Arts Administrators Association and the Australian Performing Arts Market. This conversation series is supported by the National Foundation for Australia-China Relations. And the series mainly focuses on the discussion about the impacts of COVID-19 and strategies to think through the crisis. Tonight's topic is arts advocacy, we are essential. Just a bit of a, a trigger warning, the topic of advocacy may touch on some sensitive issues. So for example, Lena from Diversity Arts Australia will be speaking about one of the, the Diversity Arts Australia projects which directly engages um, with the anti-Asian racism that has been happening um, in Australia. So in case any of the topics that we touch on um, uh, give rise to some uncomfortable feelings, I would like to invite us all to sit with discomfort to be open to complex and respectful conversations. And hopefully that will allow for intercultural exchange of some kind to happen tonight. I also want to invite all of us to take care of ourselves, whether that's as speakers or as audience members, as we unpack these questions. So as audience members, you really are very welcome to take a break whenever you need to. And speakers, please un only unpack the questions to the extent that you feel ready to um, during this public forum. So I would like to introduce our really distinguished guests tonight. So tonight we are very happy to have Kylie Bracknell, an independent artist from the Boomerang and Sphere, Helen So, lead in arts and culture from our Hong Kong Foundation, Lina Nahlus, the executive director from Diversity Arts Australia, and Winsome Chow, chief executive from the Hong Kong Arts Development Council. I would like to invite our speakers to just give some brief introductions to themselves um, each individually. And you're also welcome to add a little bit more about your organization or the work that you do. Um, I'll start with Helen. Thanks, Rani, and thank you, APAM and Hong Kong um, Arts Administrators, Administrators Association for the invite. I, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Um, I would, um, let me just, you know, give everyone a brief description of of myself, um, for those of us who are partially sighted. So I am, um, I am fully fledged uh, Hong Kong. I am currently wearing a black lace top, which is actually, might I add, it's handmade by my mom. So my mom actually <laughs> made this for me um, not, not too long ago. And, um, and yeah, so I currently work as a policy researcher um, at a local think tank in Hong Kong. We are the largest think tank, we are called the Our Hong Kong Foundation, and I currently lead the arts team there. Um, and, oh, one more thing, I'm, I'm very tall, so especially for Chinese people, I am a, um, I'm five foot 11, so that's, that's my, my brief description. So, um, yeah, and I can't wait to share more um, about the work that we're doing um, pertaining to arts advocacy later. So that would be all from me for now. Thank you, Helen, and I'm very impressed by your height. Um, <laughs> next, next, I'd like to invite Lena Nahlus from Diversity Arts Australia. Um, thanks, Lena. Thanks, Rani. Um, thanks for having me. I'm just checking that I'm not on mute. Thanks for having me here today. Um, 
I'm joining from the unceded lands of the Wongal of the Eora Nation in Australia. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge, which we like to do at Diversity Arts Australia, that diversity in all of its forms predates white colonisation in Australia. Um, I have short curly brown hair, brown eyes, and I'm wearing black rimmed glasses. I'm an Arab Australian woman and my friends say I can describe my skin colour as caramel. I don't know. It's <laughs> I'm wearing a blue top. Helen, I'm short, but I'm tall on the inside. Okay, very good. That's important. It's, it's not a competition, everyone. Um, <laughs> Winsome, can I invite you to go next? Yes, um, thanks to APAM and Hong Kong as Administrator Association. So sitting next to Helen, it um, you know, gives me a chance to describe myself as sort of more average and normal uh, Chinese person in Hong Kong. Um, I'm, you know, I'm raised in Hong Kong, educated in Hong Kong, and I bump into this profession by chance and then now I'm, you know, uh, getting to the chief executive of the Hong Kong Arts De Development Council, which actually um, has its mission to promote and support um, many art forms in Hong Kong. And today um, I feel so, you know, easy with this conversation because um, I always like Australia and um, the, 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 the mood, the, the people mainly uh, would not go uh, for formality. So I'm wearing a trench coat and then because it's windy and uh, it's also because I'm sort of senior uh, by multiple meanings. So <laughs> it's better to, um, to be in warm clothes. Thank you, Winsome. I will have to start my trench coat collection. Thank you for that tip. <laughs> um, and last but definitely not least, um, Kylie, please go ahead. Uh, Kaya Yaren, hello. Uh, my name is Kylie, uh, which actually means boomerang or small boomerang in the Nyunga language. So I am of the original first people from this place. Um, which is why I was given a name of my language from this place. So I acknowledge that I am currently on my homelands, Uwajak um, Nyungabuja, in the southwest of Western Australia. And uh, I am looking quite tired because I am uh, working with students at the moment and directing a production. Um, my background is not only Nyunga, so I'm quite um, mixed in my cultures and in my family history. Uh, my ye ye, or my father's father, who is Chinese, is actually from Malaysia. Um, it's my mother's family who are from here, from New York country. Um, so my coloring is more of, I think, the Chinese side than the Aboriginal side. I have short brown hair, which likes to be wavy or straight when it feels like it. Um, I'm wear, wearing dragonfly earrings given to me by my husband because our son, um, that's his totem. So I always feel close to our son when I wear these. Um, and I'm also dressed quite warm because um, air conditioning is not my friend. I feel quite cool inside the office space. And I'm here to, um, to breathe, to listen, to learn, absorb, and um, to share hopefully something helpful to celebrate with everyone here today. So thank you to APAM and Hong Kong Arts Administrators Association and all of the organizers for um, allowing me to share this space with you all. Thank you so much, Kylie. Um, so for audience members, what will happen now is we will have a facilitated discussion with the speakers over the next half hour, followed by a 10 minutes of Q&A. So again, just a gentle reminder, if you do want to ask specific questions, to um, put them in the Q&A chat function down the bottom. Um, so I'm going to kick us off um, about uh, tonight's topic, arts advocacy, we are essential. 
I'm really keen to um, hear from all of you in terms of what does arts advocacy mean to each of you? What have you been advocating for recently that you would like to share with the audience tonight? Are there examples or case studies that you want to highlight? Um, a bit of context from my end, um, representing Theatre Network Australia, which is um, we define our advocacy as fighting for a stronger arts sector, stronger artists and stronger organisation with a focus on independent performing artists and small to medium performing arts organisations. Um, I'd like to invite each of you to share a little bit more about what arts advocacy means. Um, so we'll start with Helen and then go to Winsome, followed by Lena and Kylie. And I can remind you all of that order as well. Um, go ahead, um, Helen. Sure. Um, so just to just to give um, everyone a little bit more background on our Hong Kong Foundation first. So we are, like I mentioned before, we are the largest think tank in Hong Kong. And obviously the role of a think tank is to conduct, you know, solid desktop um, based research as well as stakeholder engagements and advocacy to one, you know, identify the existing gaps um, in government policies. So what the government hasn't been addressing and we would, you know, then go out and do, you know, multiple rounds of stakeholder engagements, both with public as well as industry stakeholders to then internalize um, our findings into a policy research and then we would then you know submit it to the government hoping that they would um they would um adapt those into into policy and obviously i we are a think tank and we cover a lot of different policy areas and the arts innovation so the, the team that i lead is just one of many um areas that we cover and um obviously you know just to respond to Rani's question, um, you know, what does ad arts advocacy mean to me? We've, um, we've, it's, it's, it's definitely a part of my work, you know, like I do arts related research um, and it's definitely my job as a policy analyst to then communicate, having to communicate, you know, new ideas that would help the arts and cultural ecosystem in Hong Kong to thrive um, and how would I advocate like who would I speak to it would obviously be you know government officials it would be um, members of the public as well as industry you know stakeholders and let me just let me just um, take you all through kind of a recent um, campaign or a recent kind of movement that we've been looking at and we've been advocating so this was actually um, just a, re a report that we recently released uh, last year. So it was last June, so June 2020. Um, it's entitled Innovating Creative Cultures Arts Tech. And, um, you know, as the name suggests, it's, um, it advocates for a convergence of, you know, arts and technology coming together. You know, these two may be seemingly very separate concepts coming together and obviously it's not it's if you think about it it's actually not something super new you know but it's just been accelerated and made more relevant um by the pandemic obviously right and we're, we're all talking about you know new engagement models online or like new kind of webinars you know how to um how to um, connect um the technology sectors with the art sector so this report very much was a response um and uh, it, it would just it just came at a very good time basically next and um just really briefly so um as i mentioned on top of the desktop research that we do we also have to do multiple rounds of stakeholder engagements um, and from those kind of conversations and from the research that we've done we actually identified four main kind of policy um areas that we then submitted to the government and these four kind of indispensable policy arenas would obviously include you know blueprint um which which covers funding policies infrastructural related policies as well as you know network and capacity building support and um and then for the next slide we are like i am very happy to oh okay let me go through our exactly you know the concrete policy recommendations first so um, under Blueprint, funding, infrastructure and networks, we actually identified some kind of key recommendations. So on Blueprint, for example, um, there hadn't been a Blueprint that was dedicated on promoting arts tech development in Hong Kong before, um, before the kind of our report was released. So that was obviously one major recommendation. And, and obviously we had, we um, highlighted some funding support as well, um, as well as infrastructural. So like, you know, set, setting up some kind of infrastructure to support the arts tech ecosystem, as well as, you know, a digital culture platform that, you know, can connect um, 
art sectors, like people from the art circles and people with the tech circles together. So these are, I don't want to go into too much detail on the policy, um, policy stuff, but this is just for you all to have a flavor of kind of what we do at a think tank. And next slide, please. So we're obviously very happy to kind of report that, you know, through, so after uh, the release of, a report, of our report, my role doesn't end. So um, my bosses always keep telling me, you know, we're not just a think tank who publishes reports and then, you know, we shelve them or like, you know, we send them out and then, and then that's it. That's not like, that is definitely not the end of our work because we then would have to go into the community to lobby, you know, this sort of research into, into the co community as well as government officials. And so we've been doing like lots of, you know, educational workshops. We've been doing a lot of um, outreach. Um, and then obviously this is, um, I'm very happy to like, you know, share with you all that in the most recent chief executive um, policy address, it was, you know, Arts Tech made it on to the policy address and there were kind of recommendations and there were, um, uh, it was mentioned, you know, that there were a lot of policy commitments that came out um, and that fell under the four respective kind of policy arenas that we had submitted to the government. So, um, so we're very excited. And this is sort of just to give you a flavor of, of as a policy researcher, the kind of different phases of research and the different phases of um, lobbying and advocacy that we have to do. So, um, so I hope, like in the in the in the brief introduction, that I um, in the in the past five minutes or so, that I kind of gave you an idea of you know how arts advocacy towards government and public would work, right? And I just want want to show one last um, one minute trailer. Um, to give you all a flavor of how arts advocacy could also work in a different level. So um, arts advocacy is more than just kind of me, you know, giving out lectures or giving out seminars. It can also be a collaborative effort. So actually this teaser trailer that you're about to see is um, just to give you some context. It was um, produced for the launch of our arts tech report and we actually engaged a local musician slash you know he's a DJ in Hong Kong and and he helped us mix kind of um, different tunes together and you will also be able to hear kind of different audio clips of people talking and actually those people are my colleagues so I actually very much you know i not only do I advocate to external parties, I also have to advocate within my organization, you know, to, 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 to make sure we're all in this together, right? So I just wanted, you know, just to get the ball rolling to, for, for everyone to have a think about, you know, what arts advocacy means to them. It can, it can both be something, you know, outward, but it can also be something collaborative. So this is just, um, and yeah, let's just play this clip. so that's just a quick introduction from me on my definition and how I see arts advocacy in my work. Thank you, Rani. Thank you so much, Helen, and thank you for um, going into all the different channels that you know you that you your organization engages in in their advocacy. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Winsome, followed by Lena, and then Kylie. And if I can, um, I might have to be a little bit tighter with time, everyone. So sure. I'll, I'll just flag it after two minutes, if that's okay. Um, please go ahead, Winsome. Yeah, um, for Hong Kong Arts Development Council. Our day-to-day -day business, as you may know, is to distribute fundings to small and medium arts groups. 
because our so-called national companies or city companies, they are looked after uh, by the government directly with um, funding support from the Home Affairs Bureau. But then uh, those hundreds of small and medium arts uh, groups or even, you know, just uh, not even groups, individual artists, um, they are taken care of by my council. And um, so our daily job, of course, is to run different funding schemes. But then last year, um, <coughs> excuse me, we really had a big problem facing the pandemic. And um, I think us advocacy, especially at this difficult time, is to help people to get through, uh, you know, um, you know what, what they are facing. And in the art sector, um, the closure of venues uh, is a serious uh, attack on artists. I'm so sorry. Rani, I... I, I... Take, take your time, Winsome. It's okay. Um, <coughs> would you like me to pass to Lena for now? If, or... Yeah, I think so. Okay, okay. Take your time. Um, and Helen, you're welcome to turn off your microphone for now if you like. Um, Lena, did you want to... Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So um, Diversity Arts Australia is Australia's peak organisation focused on ethno-cultural racial equity in the arts and screen sectors. So we exist to increase participation, representation, opportunities for people who identify as being people of colour or culturally and linguistically diverse, which is a, also a, a terminology that's used in Australia to mean non-white migrant background people who speak languages other than English, um, people from migrant backgrounds, people from refugee backgrounds, people identify very differently here. Um, but in Australia, the, you know, 39% of the population are from culturally diverse backgrounds, uh, non-white, non-Anglo um, migrant backgrounds. And according to the Australia Council for the Arts, there's only 10% of paid artists in the sector who are from culturally, these, these backgrounds, from culturally diverse backgrounds. Um, and so we do research, we run strategic projects and campaigns that are connected to our advocacy and research. We undertake training and capacity building focused on organisations and arts companies. Um, and we recent, well, not too recently now, but... Um, we, we did a, some research a few years ago for the, for the first time in Australia that looked at nearly 2,000 arts leaders across 200 leading arts organisations. And it found that despite how diverse our cultures are in Australia, that more than half of arts organisations, that's you know, nearly 2,000 arts leaders that we surveyed, that over half organisations had no culturally diverse people at the leadership level or on the boards in the management or, or on judging panels. Um, and this kind of marginalization of, of, um, of culturally diverse artists and um, the predominantly kind of uh, sometimes um, Anglo-Celtic nature of that, that dominates our art sector doesn't represent the reality of our communities. And, um, and yeah, and, it, and it, these are real systemic issues, um, not just in the arts, um, but across the nation. Um, uh, yeah, and, uh, and I, although our focus is on cultural and linguistic diversity or people of color, we also um, work in partnership and solidarity with other communities and also with, um, you know, work intersectionally. Uh, we find that quite often one of the, the concerns of a lot of culturally diverse artists or non-white artists in Australia is that rather than being able to focus on making art or doing their creative work, they end up being unpaid advisors and community advocates because of the, the kind of systemic racism that they're facing in the sector. Um, for us, we yeah. have a model. Yeah, I'll stop. 
I'm okay. so sorry. No, I, no. I should invite you to um, show your um, source materials if that's oh, okay. Yes. I, wanna, I, I want yes. to make sure we have time for that. Apologies. Um, no, no, it's all good. Katerina, can you please show the two clips in the order? So this Sorry. is a yes, you go. Yeah, yeah, so this is a project, an advocacy project that we're working on at the moment, which is called I Am Not a Virus Australia. We've commissioned 68 artists from across Australia who identify um, as being Asian um, to create work responding to COVID racism. Um, and I wanted to also show a little video clip of one of the screen-based works that we've commissioned just the first one minute and 30 seconds of that. So here we're centralizing. So Katerina, can you show the next one when you're ready? So we're sent in here, we're centering artists themselves in the advocacy work that we do and the research that we do. In a world where attacks on Asians are on the rise. Racism is learned through... Go back to where you came from, you... Killing flu is incredibly contagious. Welcome to the year 2021. Accounts of assaults, verbal harassment, hate speech, bullying and discrimination have been numerous all over the world. There have been several reports of missing persons. I was having lunch at Mega Fishbowl House. <laughs> He's got the virus! Let's get out of here! One day, I got this letter. It's one of the virus carriers. <laughs> it's just the last thing I remember. Your mission in Australia is to find and rescue the missing persons. A single female Asian cop is woken from her cryogenic pod to unleash her inner fire. and find the missing Asians and seek justice. Grab her. You are a racist. No. I love Asia. I was serving in Nam back in 72. We are not a virus. Starring action superstar Lydia Tran, Takashi Hara, Joy Hopwood, Gabby Chan, Joe June, Quinn Chung, and introducing Ross Page. <laughs> Guest appearance by Sarah Chang and Chris Pang. Operation Kung Flu. Great, thank you so much, Lena. And um, Winsome, would you be ready to um, continue your talk? How are you feeling? Uh, sorry, one of you will need to um, turn on your microphone. There you go, yep. Yeah, so in terms of arts efficacy, I think for our council, I would say that arts efficacy is to communicate and to convince and to make known what the art sector needs. Um, by means of the art sector, I don't uh, only mean people working in the arts, but also the system, the infrastructure, the ecology of the arts, and they all matter. And then um, last year was really a challenge um, to the art sector because of the closure of venues. You know, I did a little counting just then. Um, we actually closed uh, all cultural venues for 258 days uh, since last February to now. So you can imagine uh, the jobs lost, the projects that couldn't be materialized. So um, I'm, I'm thankful actually Last year, when we detected that the problem 
would be lasting for quite some time. Um, the government uh, listened to us and we you know, came up with a support scheme that um, really cover not only the very professional arts groups and, and even to arts groups that are in the community. Um, so we, we adopted uh, more or less an, an equity approach. We try to identify people who work in the arts and um, give them a standard um, allowance, so to speak because we couldn't really pay everybody, you know, um, the, the, the kind of fee that they usually command. But then um, the government has trusted us in doing that. So we have now supported um, about 700 projects or groups so far, and also about 4,500 freelancers or individual workers and um, we used about uh, 50 million Hong Kong dollars in that um, uh, scheme. Um, that's about 8.3 Australian dollars. And we're still running that scheme in case there are people in need. Uh, people renting our uh, art spaces, they allow, you know, a three months um, rental waiver and then 75 for three months and then afterwards 75 percent concession till now so we we try we try to um you know keep everybody at float in the situation and that is what we can do um you know as a funding agency but we didn't actually um just give our money because last Last year, uh, right after you know the outbreak of the pandemic, um, I talked to our jockey club uh, friends. Well, jockey club actually uh, function like the lottery funds, and they have they are actually one of the uh, top ten uh, philanthropic uh, organizations in the world. So. Um, I went to them to ask for some kind of support because people were out of jobs. Uh, artists uh, couldn't do projects. And at the same time, we also felt the need to um, really enable artists to try something new during this difficult moment. Something that they did not have to go to the public venues and um, deliver something that they could do even uh, in their own studios or in small groups because all venues were closed and um, together with um, the senior uh, people in the jockey club we figure out a scheme which is called the art school digital scheme mm. uh, whereby we you know yeah. gave uh, now up to a total of 58 groups, um, mm. quite a sum of money mm. to try using uh, new technology to revitalize mm. what they have been doing or maybe make something new. And, but of course, the jockey club would have some requirements. And, and actually, I think arts advocacy, it's also, uh, that is why, you know, a kind of communication. Mm that you have to find the equilibrium, uh, the common good, the common ground, so that everybody can do their own work. And in this project, we not only enable artists to um, enrich their own works, or maybe try uh, new technology to reach out to new audiences or build new relationship, but we also have to satisfy our funder that we would use these projects to enrich people's life because mm. there are yeah. so many people having to stay home, not being able to go out uh, for, you know, for mm. school, for, for work. 
And so many people stay home. What are they doing? And then, and then the Art School Digital Winsome, Platform I'm, provides I'm them with lots so of So sorry, work. Winsome. Yeah. I, my apologies. I, I will um, need to interrupt my apologies um, just to make sure that Kylie also has a chance to introduce um, part sure, of their work. Sure, Is that okay, sure. Winsome? But thank you so much um, between you and Helen. I'm, I, it was such a useful introduction to art advocacy in the Hong Kong context. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, would there be a chance to maybe later on? Uh, maybe there there is the, time for Q and A, so we can we can we can unpack a little bit more. Honestly, I could talk to all of you for days. <laughs> all right. Um, but if it's okay, my apologies. Uh, I'll need to bring Kylie in. Um, uh, is it okay? Uh, so yes. So Kylie, did you want to do a quick um, intro and then? Um, We'll pass it back to Winsome to show some of the source materials. Sure, yeah. Um, so arts advocacy, uh, what it means to me is leadership through action. Um, I am from Boomerang and Spear. I'm the Boomerang and my husband's actually the Spear. So we're both creative people, individual, independent artists, um, but we engage with lots of arts orgs and festivals. Um, so leadership through action is something that's important to Boomerang and Spear, to us, to me, um, how I've advocated for the arts through that kind of um, act or the action of showing advocacy is um, questioning a lot of things that Lena and Winston speak to in terms of um, systemic topics. Um, and Winston mentioned, you know, keeping everyone afloat and, and enriching people's lives is something that I can relate to as a first people of this area where often we are not the first consideration. Um, fortunately, and I'll bring it back to work for now because I could talk about that in much more layered depth, but I won't um, because of time considerations and also we'll just wait to unpack some of that in the Q&A. But the two particular works that I've advocated in particular for our language, which is currently endangered. Nyungar language is spoken by just 2% of our community, 2%. Um, I would argue how many of that 2% are actually fluent in our language. And one of the projects was Hecate. It was an adaptation of Shakespeare's Macbeth translated into Nyungar language. It was the first time in Australia that a Shakespeare work in its entirety had been translated into one language from this country. Um, I might actually get some images from that to pop up on the screen so you can absorb some of what that might look like or did look like rather. The adaptation gave the Queen of the Witches, Hecate, um, the lead role in this production. And we were fortunate enough to close this production, which was a part of, um, presented by Yuri Arkin Theatre Company in association with Bell Shakespeare, um, and presented at Perth Festival 2020. The production concluded just before COVID hit Perth and Western Australia. And the artists certainly felt full and fortunate and full of gratitude that we were able to, after um, eight to 10 years of developing this work, to have it staged for community. The social impact was great. Um, what we did through this production was increase our speaking capacity in community by nine more people who could confidently speak their language. So advocacy through art to keep a language alive, is just really, really important because that does enrich people's lives, what Winsome spoke to. Um, and it's certainly a community advocate. So I can relate Lena to what you were speaking to with that. The other project that I'll just mention before I pass back to Rani um, is a project called Fist of Fury Nyunga Da. It was, inspired by the Navajo version of Star Wars, um, which was brought to my attention by a colleague of mine at Perth Festival, which I'm also an associate artist um, there. Um, but I actually, and I know we're, we're getting into, I think I'll mention this as a, something that I fought for. So I fought to not do Star Wars. I fought to do something more art house. This again is another world first. It's the first time that any feature film in the world or from this country has been translated into one language here from Australia. Um, I have immense gratitude in my heart that it is Nyunga and that I could show leadership through action in this. I fought for a more arts 
um, art house feel film. I wanted to, in order to not seem to favor any particular film that is Australian, um, to choose something that wasn't Australian. And it was at that point um, of lockdown and how the world was suffering, if I may use that for lack of a better word to represent all of us at the moment. Um, it, I'm holding back tears when I say that because I'm revisiting that moment. Um, something I haven't spoken about in any of my interviews with this is that I could almost feel the pain of the Asian community and it's a little bit serendipitous that this film was chosen because it wasn't the main reason. I, I didn't want to advocate for Asian community because I didn't meet my grandfather till I was 21. So I don't feel like I can represent in that way. But um, I knew that when it comes to Nyungar language, which is something that I've been taught since I was young, that my people from that generation in the seventies, when this film came out and was a worldwide hit and made Bruce Lee famous, was the first time that my people saw some, someone that isn't white in a lead role on the screen. And that is the generation that had the language taken from them. So this was also not just advocating for art, but advocating for healing inside art, advocating for restoration of language, a fundamental and integral part of any people's culture inside art and um, and a chance for we had Hecate and the nine cast become speakers and so it's a chance for 21 people which included myself so um, to amplify Nyungar language again and bring it to life here's a little behind the scenes clip to give you a feel of it today's going to be a lot of fun Watch the people as soon as they join and start talking. Here we go. Rolling. Pork you and gap. Bal boga. Bakach bedding. Pola and bal. Borda cut. One more, please, Anirema. Your niche. Do you about what you're narrating? Your bal noich. Bal of bull wanking yay. And just maneuver your dar however you need to to get the quickness of the line or the consonants. I think it's just nice that there's something pulsing in a way where they know the impact is going to be great and where it's going to represent them in a good way. Nice. Yeah. Um, so this project was definitely a way of trying new models of advocacy. Um, I think I'm just teary because I'm sitting with a big group of Asian people. Um, it, it was definitely, um, you know, fighting for arts in a different way to collaborate. Um, I was thinking of innovative ways to advocate for art and to not just um, stick to the confinement of what it should be. Um, and in finishing, uh, uh, yeah, they're my two um, case studies, but I also advocate through all of the positions that I take up whenever I collaborate, whether it's with an arts organization or other artists um, or events or things like that to, to be a good listener and to advocate for things that I that I am knowledgeable in. So I'll stop there, but they're the two things that I wanted to share to, to demonstrate my arts advocacy. Thank you, Kylie. And thank you for being vulnerable with your tears and with your emotions as well. You know, I think it's very understandable for us to feel all of the things that we're feeling when we're talking about something so complex and that matters so much to all of us, um, in this case, arts advocacy. Um, I apologize, Winsome. Uh, I think in rushing through, I forgot to invite you to share your source material. So my profound apologies for that. Um, why don't we um, show Winsome's um, materials and then um, we can move on to the next uh, questions. Thank you. Oh, 
Rani, yes. Rani, could I could I yes. you know say a few words on Absolutely. the recording? Absolutely. Because especially yep. um, after what Kylie said, I think I must explain a bit because um, this is exactly the same thing. Um, in the video, you you must have heard two male singers, one singing um, the very traditional Chinese Nanying, the older person. And the younger person actually is a pop star singing the rap and the uh, pop, canton pop. Actually, the whole idea was from the older singer who is so, you know, famous for his Cantonese operatic singing, a kind of storytelling in the past which actually, you know, does not happen anymore uh, uh, on earth, uh, it, unless in theatres, uh, as we now stage, but not in the form that they were done some more than 100, 200 years ago, when singers would travel from uh, one Chinese restaurant to another and playing among the tables and singing and begging for money. Okay, telling stories, and um, and and now because uh, the older singer had has this wish to keep this as a heritage and pass it on um, to to our younger generation that we have such a chapter in our cultural life, and but then adding the pop singer would uh, have some kind of um, you know passing on the, the our, our culture. It's with the same intention of how to keep our heritage alive. And that's that's the that's it. And and in in doing it, we actually echo what Helen and her foundation has been promoting the use of technology. So you could see you know a really rich collage of images, soundscape, and also um, singing uh, music. Yeah, that's all. I, I, I just want to show, I mean, this is actually Hong Kong in a nutshell, the past and the, and the present, the new and the old. Yeah. Thank you so much, Winsome. And again, please accept my apologies for passing over that earlier. I really apologize for that. Oh, you can't hear me? Oh. Can you hear me now? I can. That is very strange. Um, I, can hear I can hear you. Okay, great. I just have to take Oh, oh it's, okay. it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Okay, you can, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to keep going. Um, so I thought, again, I might remind um, the audience that you can put your questions in the Q&A um, chat function. And um, I thought I'd draw out some themes that I felt that I was hearing across um, the four of you and your sharing. Um, I thought there was a really strong theme of um, having a practice of listening to really diverse groups of people and then communicating what you learn from these diverse groups of people through the appropriate channels. I felt like that was a really strong um, uh, part of advocacy for all of you. Um, another theme that I, that I thought came through really strongly was a, um, an awareness of the broader context. So um, Winsome, when you were describing some of the advocacy that you've been doing, you spoke about you know, the, the venue closures and the really shocking um, number of days that you mentioned earlier. And um, so being aware of that broader context and that leading to very specific advocacy goals in the form of, for, for example, rental waivers. Another theme I thought was the practice of collaboration um, uh, with government, but also with non-government and then working with artists directly, working with philanthropists. And it sounds like actually with the pressures that COVID um, placed us, all of us under, it also pushed all of you to try new things um, in those practices of collaboration. 
And then finally, uh, another point that I thought was um, a common thread was preserving culture as a form of um, arts advocacy as well. And I just want to thank all of you for such generous sharings, especially on that point. Um, I'm also, um, being Chinese Indonesian, um, my family are also survivors of very systematic cultural genocide, some of which was targeted at making sure that I didn't learn any of the Chinese languages um, that were present in my grandparents' time. So I really appreciate the generous sharing that you brought into the space um, on that theme. Um, I might ask you a really specific question ar arising out of, out of those commonalities. I, I guess I just wondered, um, what does sustainability mean to you and your organization um, with, within such a challenging time? Um, and it sounds like you've already been grappling with that question. But I'm keen to unpack that a little bit, a little bit more with all of you. Um, Winsome, did you want to uh, start us off? Winsome or Helen? Well, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, to me, I always have this tripod theory <laughs> myself. I think, you know, um, in physics, if you have a tripod um, that you would hold things more steadily, more firmly. And I think it's the same in the arts. Um, in the arts, I think if you if there are artists, there will be artworks, but then artworks need audiences. And then uh, what makes the artists uh, capable of uh, presenting that would need some kind of either community support, uh, donation or government support. So there are always three sides. And then um, the firmer the tripod is, the more sustainable you are. What I'm saying is that for any artist trying to do anything, I would always uh, say to them, they have to find the tripod for themselves. It's not only the art that counts. Mm -hmm. You need an audience. You need to know how to communicate with your audience and get your audience, get your following. And then you also need either government funding or maybe venue support or maybe some donors. And then, so you have, you have to find yourself a tripod. One of the schemes that we are running in our council is the matching fund scheme, which is based on that theory. So in a matching fund scheme, everyone coming uh, to, to us saying that they have raised $1, we will give them $1.5. So far as their art, uh, you know, products or work or whatever projects, uh, they are found really professional, uh, of value and, you know, uh, acceptable to the professional standard and we will fund them. And throughout the pandemic, I don't see any recession in a number of applications. And I only see that, yes, a uh, corporate sponsor may so, sort of sh shy the way a bit, but private donors are growing stronger. And I think in this community of Hong Kong, we do have um, the kind of bondage in our people and the strength of our community to work together. So arts groups are trying to find um, perhaps harder private donors and giving little amounts, but grouping together so that they can do a project. And then, um, so we still open our doors to them. So um, thanks to the original design of our scheme. Um, so we, we are able to do that. And I think this is one of the examples that my tripod theory works. Yeah, and just to really quickly, could I just um, really quickly follow up on, on Winsome's point? Because I actually think I completely agree with what, with kind of Winsome's take on kind of the definition and concept of sustainability and how that kind of relates to, to our discussion. Because I also resonate with the idea that, you know, talking talks of sustainability obviously revolve around you know, ecosystem, 
kind of support because we're talking about for, for in, in order for the arts and cultural industries to kind of sustain you obviously need as Winston put her, you know, the tri her tripod theory. And I can't agree more because as a policy kind of person, I would look at the whole ecosystem. So you need, we can't just have the, the people at front of house. You always need, you know, the backstage support. You need um, where your talent's coming from, for example. You need input from educational and tertiary institutions. You need funders, you need, you know, corporate public and private partnerships, you need support from the government. You need, you know, international collaborators. It's all part of an ecosystem kind of driver. And I just can't agree more with kind of, if we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about ecosystem kind of support, how to, you know, um, how to um, expand and educate your audiences as well. You know, the whole supply and demand, you know, the whole ecosystem. So um, yeah, just, a really quick kind of follow-up from Winston's point. Thank you, Helen. Um, Kylie and Lena, did either of you want to add any points about sustainability? And then I will um, move us on to Q&A because we've got a couple of questions from the audience. Um, um, Lena? I, I, I'm happy for Kylie to go first. If, yeah. do you, Kylie, are you happy, do you want to say talk first? I don't feel like I need to add anything to that. I think that um, I agree with, with all of that. And I think that um, we just need to let common sense prevail with that. And, and just to add that people and society are often um, the aspects of sustainability that people tend to not put investment into mm -hmm. and relationships in that, that reflect from that. And um, I totally ag agree. I was just nodding my head in agreement with Winsome and Helen's points. Um, for me, sustainability means not burning out. And for those of us in the racial equity space, there's a real danger of this because, you know, this, we're really personally invested and we end up doing a lot of unpaid work and becoming educators and trainers, like I mentioned earlier. But it is very much about that, what Winsom was talking about and Helen was talking about, about those cross um, those partnerships that go beyond the, beyond the art. So for me, it's it's about those robust partnerships, relationships, so that it's not reliant on one organisation or a few organisations or a few individuals. Because if you have those partnerships and they're international partnerships, then you can provide support in ways that, and you can be provided with support in ways that you sometimes can't do yourself. And, you know, other organisations, if, if you can't speak out, for example, other organisations will have your back and be able to do that. Um, for me, reaching those audiences is crucial. We can't just have the conversation amongst ourselves. For us, you know, outcomes that engage broader audiences and communities are just so important because they need to be part of these conversations and provide this support to the arts and creative sectors. For our, and I'll be very quick, we have a podcast called The Colour Cycle. Um, the first season of it, was aired on Virgin In-Flight Entertainment a few years ago, and it was aired for a few months. And that was a really awesome outcome for us because these conversations about racial equity in the arts were being listened to by people who might not know about our organisation or the work that we do. And similarly, we recently um, released an anthology called After Australia of short stories. And that was, uh, we had to do a second print run with an, almost a month of it being published. So to me, that was about having those those broader audiences and support and so many other things but i'm going to stop <laughs> Alan, did you have sorry can i really, really quickly have one follow-up i just uh, one idea just popped up into my mind as you know lena was talking about was you know um giving her sharing and i just thought you know on the topic of sustainability actually the whole conversation of arts and health you know, um, Kylie mentioned arts for healing. I think I cannot agree more. And especially as we're talking about sustainability, obviously, you know, the idea of, you know, a circular kind of um, a cycle, like, you know, how arts actually, the impacts of health and the impacts of mental health, you know, all that, it contributes to our discussion of, you know, how, how arts can be sustained. And I mean, I don't want to, I'm just dropping, you know, I'm just dropping an idea in here because I don't know, I don't want to open another can of worms, but I'm just kind of throwing in the idea of, you know, arts and its impacts for health could also be such um, a huge, you know, topic for potential, you know, discussion as well, if we're talking about sustainability and the arts. 
Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's a really, really important point, um, Helen. And I also just want to give a shout out to um, one of the partnerships that I know, um, Lena, that you're talking about in terms of non-arts partnerships was your partnership with the Asian Australian Alliance and Democracy in Colour, you know, who were leading on the research about anti-Asian violence. But then you, as Diversity Arts Australia, commissioned artworks in response to those research findings. So I think it's, um, I think it's a really strong example. Um, maybe I'm a bit biased, but it is a very strong example Lena, I think of how non-arts and arts partnerships can really um, level up our um, arts advocacy work. Um, and okay, I am conscious of time as I should be as the moderator. So I will bring out um, a couple of questions from the audience. So um, I'm going to um, choose this one from Kelly Chan. Thank you all for your generous sharing. My question is, what's your advice for artists and aspiring artists to not just survive, but thrive in the times of uncertainty and in Hong Kong, especially times of fear? Access to technology and venues is just one of the challenges artists face. How could artists handle the dire situation of limited freedom to create and express? Um, thanks. Would anyone um, from the panel feel comfortable to um, answer this question? Um, I might jump in the deep end and yeah. um, share my my heart instinct to that one. Um, I think that in wrapping all of the conversations and the late edition that Helen mentioned earlier about healing is that artists in their busyness of trying to fight for their place to be seen as essential can tread the fine line of not advocating enough that we are actually art. So when I say we are art, in these times of difficulty, the people that you have access to, to thrive, are the people that know where you come from. Hence your parents, your family, um, find out, use these times to thicken or enhance or strengthen your identity, the place where you come from, because art comes from stories. And if you have a story that is yours, that is not somebody else's, you can create incredible art from that. So keep your vision broad and your, and your willingness to understand art and how you can be that or contribute to that open, completely open, but never forget that foundation and identity is key. So become agile and um, don't stare at the closed door too long. Beautiful answer, Kylie, thank you. Unless anyone wants to add anything, I might move us on to Kevin's um, question. Did anyone want to add anything? I, I wanted to add that there was such a, you know, international outpouring of love and solidarity with, you know, black Americans with the killing of George Floyd that kind of triggered, a, you know, kind of work, you know, activism all, all around the world. And in Australia, you know, um, Aboriginal deaths in custody movement has been around for a very long time, but also in solidarity with the Black Lives Matters movement. And I know that in Australia during COVID, as we were watching what was happening in Hong Kong, there was a lot of love and solidarity with artists and creatives. So that's um, so kind of reaching out and connecting across borders and having that solidarity and support where, where it can be provided and not harm people within Hong Kong, for example, um, I think is really, there might be opportunities for you to make work and create work still within Hong Kong and about Hong Kong, but maybe through those international co collaborations um, if that's kind of answering your question. Wonderful. Um, I will move us on to the next question, if that's all right. So there's a question here from Kevin Brennan, um, who uh, quotes a, a new approach, which is an independent think tank um, in Australia. So I'll read Kevin's question. Research by a new approach in Australia shows that the word arts is a problem. 30% feel that art is irrelevant to them and another 40% ambivalent. A new approach suggests using it rarely and always in combination with culture. Is there any research about using language in Hong Kong? Is it too contentious to suggest that we focus more on using words like creative, creative projects and culture to reach broader audiences and win public and political support? 
Um, Helen and Winston, did you want to add anything to respond to that? Okay. Well, I think this is a very actually, thank you for the question because this is, uh, it's, it's a really kind of refreshing question actually. And um, I would be, so um, sorry, Rani, did you mention that a new approach is an Australian based? Think Independent tank, yeah? think tank, yep. Um, yeah. Phil uh, philanthropically funded, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. No, interesting. Because um, I actually think, you know, I would be interested to know whether, you know, um, a new approaches um, observation here would actually be the case for Hong Kong, because actually um, talking about, you know, how people relate or associate to the word arts or like creativity or culture, I think it's definitely culture specific, right? So um, interestingly, just, just a really quick sharing, we actually um, talking about, you know, when we were thinking of the appropriate title to our art tech report, and just to remind everyone, it was Innovating Creative Cultures, colon, arts tech. We actually did think about, you know, oh, are we gonna put creativity? Are we gonna put arts? Are we gonna put culture? And actually we, en we ended up actually using creative cultures. So, <laughs> I actually found that, you know, I didn't, I didn't know about a new approaches kind of um, finding there. So perhaps there is some, you know, truth to this. And I think it's definitely in the radar for Hong Kong, you know, um, policymakers really, um, pertaining to arts and culture sectors to really try and really change this. You know, arts is not supposed to be like we don't want as arts advocates ourselves, we don't, obviously we don't want arts to feel like it's aloof or like something that is irrelevant to the mass public. So um, I definitely think, um, you know, you need to be mindful and kind of sensitive to your choice of language when you're speaking to different demographics of people and just a personal sharing, like even when, cause I see a lot of, I meet with a lot of stakeholders from different backgrounds when I talk to them about, you know, my research and oftentimes, like most often than not, I would actually have to alter my language a little bit to make sure they understand the message that I'm trying to convey across. And most often than not, you know, I, I use different words to talk to different people. And that's just part of, I think that is part of um, the sensitivity that we need to kind of build as art advocates. Thank you, Helen. Um, Winsom and Lena, did you want to add anything? No? It yeah. was perfect. <laughs> it's good. I will, um, I will wrap us up here and I'm just gonna give you all um, the opportunity to take us some, you know, to the, to the close. In only a couple of words in your responses, what have been unexpected lessons during this time? In just a couple of words. Um, Lena, did you wanna start us off? Um, just, I guess unexpected is for the first time in my lifetime, um, which is a, you know, a, it, that basically people are talking about structural racism in Australia and acknowledging structural racism. And we were overwhelmed with requests um, for training and support for organisations um, that you, you, who would have never been approaching or talking to us previously because of how intense um, the, the calling out and the discussions were about racial inequity in the creative sector in Australia and globally. So that was very unexpected. Um, and Winsome, and, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Lena, yeah. Um, Winsome and Helen, did you want to share any unexpected lessons? Um, to me, I think, um, to my surprise, um, the importance that we all attach to our heritage, to our past. You know, it's something that I did not expect to, to get from this session because we seem to be looking at things, um, you know, going into the future. But actually uh, we live in an environment and that actually it's nurtured by our past, I think. Well, that's, that's the lesson that I think about. Beautifully put. Helen? Um, yeah, for me, just really, it's it's a bit, it's just to put a lighter kind of mo mood to this. Um, it's just, I it, my unexpected lesson was that, you know, Zoom can be quite creative as well. Like you, we really can, you know, 
performances can take place on Zoom. Obviously, it's different to this physical, but there are so many kind of different opportunities for creatives, for artists to really like, really, you know, use their creativity to kind of build and curate, you know, um, productions or performances that they've never imagined before using like something as rigid as, you know, um, Zoom platforms. So that's that's an unexpected lesson Thank for me. You. And Carly, do you want to take us home before I wrap us up? I would like to, I'm lost for words. Um, I would just like to um, acknowledge Winsome's acknowledgement of future and to say that um, we get so busy focusing on what changes we can make, um, what we can work towards. And I think that's contradictive to sustainability sometimes. I think that it's important to acknowledge who we have around us. It's important to acknowledge the lessons of the teachings of the people who are around us and to never ever forget that art comes from us. Um, something that I spoke to in the director's notes for Hecate and William Shakespeare talking about, he wrote a, I'm gonna bugger this up, but he, he wrote about life being um, rounded by sleep and so something from our people's culture is we know we come from the stars. When you see a shooting star, we know a new life is coming. So death is not the end for us. Um, so there's lots of lessons in life itself and we tend to forget that we're living, we're striving to um, work out what our heartbeat is instead of just feeling it sometimes. Um, I don't know if that resonates right. I did proceed by saying I'm lost for words. Maybe I'm not using the right language. I'm using English. Mm. Um, is it my mother tongue but um you no, are welcome to use other like moment, to just live in the moment a little more and appreciate art in everything mm. and yeah. everyone thank you um thank you for such a beautiful closing note um and audience members thank you again for joining us um round of applause zoom claps for our panel and um, we hope that you enjoyed the conversation and also after leaving the talk, we will be sending you the post-event survey. So please take a few minutes to write us some comments for our review um, for, for us to use. Thank you everyone, big claps. Have a good rest of your night.